Hello and welcome. I'm Catherine Banwell, your host for today's program. Today, we're going to talk about how to live and thrive with an MPN. We're going to discuss MPN treatment goals and how you can play an active role in your care. Before we get into the discussion, please remember that this program is not a substitute for seeking medical advice. Please refer to your healthcare team about what might be best for you. Well, joining us today is Dr. Jean Palmer. Dr. Palmer, welcome. Would you please introduce yourself? Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here and to help participate in this. Um, my name is Jean Palmer. I am a hematologist at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. Um, I specialize in MPNs um, as well as transplant, uh, bone marrow transplant. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today, Dr. Palmer. We start all of the webinars in our Thrive series with the same question, and that is, what does it mean to you to thrive with an MPN? I think living with an MPN can be very difficult. I, th- I think there's a there's a number of things. First of all, there's always the worry of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, many of these MPNs can start as fairly, uh, for lack of better terms, benign issues and can convert to something much more serious. So I think living with that that sort of time bomb in the back it's, can be extremely stressful. So figuring out how to live with the fact that there is some degree of uncertainty. Um, I think the other thing is making sure to understand your disease. You know, these are very rare disorders. And even if you go to a hematologist, oncologist, specialist, a lot of times they don't have all the information because they don't see a lot of them every year. So it's really important to make sure that above and beyond that, you understand what's going on in your body so that when new things happen, new symptoms happen, you're able to really address them as opposed to sort of living with something that may make you feel poorly um, that's not being addressed. So Um, Again, I think the biggest piece of this is saying, how do you live with uncertainty and how do you make sure you understand your disease well enough that you know that what's going on in your own body? Yeah, that's helpful to understand, uh, especially as we move through today's program. And we're going to cover the three classic MPNs, polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia and myelofibrosis. One part of thriving with an MPN is managing the symptoms of the disease. Would you walk us through the common symptoms of each of the MPNs? Let's start with essential thrombocythemia. Right. So there are a number of shared symptoms throughout all the diseases. And when we start to figure out how to categorize them, they fall into several different categories. The first one is inflammation-related symptoms. We know that the inherent pathway that's dysregulated or that causes these diseases to happen can also result in significant inflammation in a person. That can result in things like fevers, night sweats, weight loss, um, and overall feeling really fatigued and poorly, which is something that um, it seems to be much more prevalent in patients with MPNs, all sorts of them, actually. Um, The next set of symptoms uh, is related to microvasculature, so all the little blood vessels. And, you know, sometimes we think, oh, maybe that's because there's too many blood, you know, red blood cells or platelets and the blood becomes viscous. It's probably more related to the actual dysregulation of that, the JAK2 pathway, which is inherent to all the myeloproliferative diseases. And as a result, the little blood vessels can clamp down. That can give people headaches, visual changes, numbness and tingling in the hands and feet, and even can cause sort of a painful rash called erythromyalgia on, you know, in the body, which, so these are things that, that can happen that are probably less appreciated side effects of the disease. And finally, there's spleen related symptoms. The spleen is in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. And it's an organ that generally is about 12 centimeters in length, 10 to 12. But in patients with myeloproliferative diseases, it can be enlarged. And as a result of an enlarged spleen, people can have feeling like they feel get full early. So if you're eating a meal, all of a sudden you can only eat half of that meal versus a whole meal. Um, Discomfort or pain in the left upper quadrant sometimes is much more noticeable when you like bend over to tie your shoes. And then sometimes people can actually, when the spleen gets really big, the blood flow can be impaired towards the end of it, which can cause some of the spleen tissue to die and that can be painful. So these are things that if somebody does start to notice that they're having, you know, fullness in the left upper quadrant, pain, stuff like that, that that may be related to spleen symptoms. Mm -hmm. Uh, What about PV or polycythemia vera? What are the symptoms? So all of these, oh, all of these sort of relate to all of the myeloproliferative diseases. The one other one that I didn't mention, and this is actually more in PV than others, is um, itching. Itching can be absolutely unbearable when somebody has PV. It's particularly noticeable after taking a shower. So a lot of times I've, I've met patients who are like, I haven't been able to take a shower in years because it, it causes such a high degree of itching. 
And this is why, one why a shower? Is that it, it, is it different from having a bath? water on the body that can cause the problem. So like if people take hot showers, it's even worse. Although I have, um, you know, I think that the, the people sort of react to it differently. Uh, usually what patients end up doing is more like sponge bath type of things rather than actually being exposed to the, to, you know, the, the water taking colder showers or cooler showers can sometimes help mitigate that. Uh, but the itching, and even in the absence of a shower, people can have pretty severe itching and that can also be the major side effects. Much of the time, the chosen treatment for MPNs manages the symptoms of the condition. I'd like to review the different types and classes of treatment for the three MPNs. And so let's start with essential thrombocythemia again. When is it time to treat and what are the options available? Right. So with essential thrombocythemia, that's the disease that sometimes we don't need to treat. So we basically have a risk stratification system. And this risk is based on age, um, history of a blood clot, the presence or absence of the JAK2 mutation. So for example, if somebody is 28, does not have a JAK2 mutation, which is again, one of those driver mutations, um, then, and never had a blood clot, they actually don't necessarily need to do anything and just be monitored. Somebody who is, who is less than 60 and has a JAK2 mutation, or who is greater than 60 and does not have a JAK2 mutation, in that setting, a lot of times you can use aspirin. Um, now it gets a little bit a little bit gray in terms of that over 60 without the JAK2 mutation with regards to whether at that point you really should start taking some medicine to lower the platelets. Now, if somebody has a JAK2 mutation, is greater than 60 or has had a blood clot, hands down, they need to take medicine to lower the platelets in addition to aspirin or whatever you know, blood thinner they may need. So for example, if you have a blood clot in a vein, a lot of times you need to take a blood thinner and that will be a lifelong thing. Um, and again, because we do these risk stratifications because we know there's a certain risk of clotting associated with the risk of essential thrombocythemia. So for example, somebody who's less than 60 and does not have a JAK2 mutation, never had a clot, their risk of clotting is probably very close to that of the normal population. Whereas if you're higher risk and have a JAK2 mutation greater than 60 or have had a history of a clot, the risk of clot is probably about 4% per year. So this is something that can vary quite widely. And even though that 4% per year in the short term doesn't sound like a lot. If you take it additive over years, that's why we generally try to be aggressive about lowering the platelets. Now, lowering the platelets, the goal is to get less than 400. Um, and doing that can be done through several different medications. The most commonly used medications is a drug called hydroxyurea, which has been around for a number of years, um, and a drug called enagrolide, which is probably a little less commonly used because of um, it has some more GI side effects and headaches uh, associated with it. Um, in some cases, especially in younger patients with this disease, we can consider using interferon, which is an injection of a cytokine, a, a sort of set, which are one of the chemicals that regulates the immune system within the body. But this interferon can actually um, help lower the platelets. And there is a question of whether it may affect the biology of the disease as well. Let's turn to uh, polycythemia vera or PV. What, um, what are the different... Uh, options available for treating it? So for polycythemia vera, um, everyone needs to be on aspirin. And additionally, everyone needs to make sure to keep their blood count low to, to manage their hematocrit, which is one of the measures of red blood cells. So in men, it's generally recommended to keep below 45. And in women, it's recommended to keep below 42%. Now, the studied number was 45%, and that was a study that was done I don't know, probably about 10, 10 plus years ago that actually showed that by keeping the blood hematocrit less than 45%, you reduce the risk of having that negative events like cardiovascular events and heart attacks. Um, because women tend to run with a lower blood count than men, um, it's been extrapolated that 42% should be the, the number used for women. Um, now, this can be done by phlebotomy, which essentially is bloodletting. It's kind of like donating blood, except for that the blood, unfortunately, can't be donated to anybody. It has to be discarded. Um, but the phlebotomy is one way to do that. And the reason that works is because it makes somebody iron deficient. So whereas if you're this is if this is normal, if you're iron deficient, become anemic. If your baseline hematocrit here, bringing, making you iron deficient brings you back to normal. So even though we always associate iron deficiency with anemia, um, iron deficiency in the setting of polycythemia vera is actually kind of a, a treatment of sorts. 
Um, now, the, there are, once somebody gets above 60, and 60 seems to be sort of the magic age in these diseases, um, once somebody gets above 60, it is recommended that cytoreductive therapy is used, which means therapy or treatment that will bring down the red count. And again, for this one, um, hydroxyurea is an option as well as interferon. And there's recently an approval, um, actually FDA approval for a newer interferon called Ropeg interferon or Bezremi, uh, which does help bring down the red, uh, which can help bring down the red blood cells, but it is the first interferon that's actually been FDA approved for this indication. Um, are JAK inhibitors used as well? They are. So if somebody doesn't respond well to hydroxyurea, um, the approval for JAK is actually for patients who have failed hydroxyurea. Although it's something that we often consider, especially in people who have a lot of symptoms. So the itching, um, one of the things that can really help itching actually is JAK um, If people have night sweats, they have weight loss, spleen related symptoms, those are the patients that will benefit from JAK Additionally, if they're on hydroxyurea and, and can't seem to get control of their blood count, JAK is a, a good option to help control the blood counts as well. Um, interferon is a, a very nice option because there's great data that is, shows that you may actually be able to lower the percentage of JAK2 burden. So we look at something called an allele burden, which is a percentage of cells that are involved have the JAK2 mutation. Now, we don't know whether lowering this percentage necessarily translate to long-term better survival, but I think there's enough data out there and there's a good biologic underpinning for saying that this actually can help. Um, but yes, Jacopy is another thing. And a really exciting thing is that there's a newer agent called uh, rusfertide, which is a hepcidin mimetic, which is basically taking a protein in your body that helps metabolize iron. And by making it externally and giving it to somebody, that can actually help bring down the hematocrit without having some of the other side effects we know with some of the other medications. That is currently in phase three studies. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll see approval for that. Oh, that's great news. And, and finally, how is myelofibrosis treated? So myelofibrosis is a little bit of a different animal. When you have something like essential thrombocythemia or PV, a lot of this is managing symptoms, preventing blood clots. But you know, if you do appropriate treatment and management of these diseases, you could probably live close to a normal life expectancy. So I never typically pin a survival on it. With myelofibrosis, it's a little bit different because there is a survival you know, we, we, we do, instead of saying you can live close to normal life expectancy, it backs up to saying, how many years do I think you can live with this disease? Now, of course, we are horrible at predicting how many years anyone can live. So we have to take that all with a grain of salt, but we can at least sort of risk stratify people. And the first thing that's really important is to figure out whether somebody's a transplant candidate or not. And that would is based on age, disease risk features, stuff like that, or whether we think they ever will be a transplant candidate. Um, so that kind of helps us sort of think about what our path moving forward is. Now, the current FDA approved treatment for myelofibrosis, there are three uh, JAK inhibitors approved, what JAK in, or which is like Jacophy, um, which was the first approved one, but there's also Enrebic or Fedratinib and Vonjo or Pacritinib. And these have all been approved over the years. Um, the role of JAK inhibitors in treatment of myelofibrosis is symptoms based. So for example, a lot of patients with myelofibrosis will have weight loss, night sweats, you know, big spleens, you know, really feeling fatigued and poorly. And in this setting, the JAK inhibitor can be very helpful. And not it, you don't have to have a JAK2 mutation. A lot of times people say, well, I don't have the JAK2 mutation, so how can a JAK inhibitor help? So the JAK inhibitor works on this pathway, which is called the JAK-STAT pathway, irrespective of mutation. So if you are having symptoms and you have myelofibrosis, JAK, inhibit, JAK mutation, excuse me, the JAK2 mutation does not predict who's going to have a response. Um, and people who, regardless of which mutation you have, may actually benefit from it. So um, the JAK inhibitors, though, are extremely effective at reducing symptom burden, as well as reducing the spleen size. Um, and we know that if a spleen is big and we can make it shrink, that that probably is a surrogate marker for living longer. And I think it's because inflammation does a lot of wear and tear on the body. So if you can reduce the inflammation, you know, that's in the spleen shrinks, which generally go hand in hand, then you might help somebody live longer. It is not changing the biology of the disease. So however, it doesn't change the pathway and that this disease is kind of projecting ahead in terms of, um, of, of creating 
it can it, it, it changes as it goes along. They acquire new mutations or something like that, which makes the disease become more serious. Um, unfortunately, you know, right now the approved therapies for it are JAK inhibitors, and the JAK afirexolitinib was the first one approved, and Rebig was approved several years back, or fedratinib, um, and then the most recent one that was approved is Vonjo or Pacritinib, and that's a drug that is a JAK inhibitor um, that is actually very good for people with low platelets. And the reason I bring that up is because if we think of what's the biggest limiter of JAK inhibitors, JAK inhibitors bring down red blood cells and they bring down platelets. So when somebody has low platelets, it's very hard to use a JAK inhibitor because we're not really able to increase the dose well enough to get that inflammatory reduction because of the fact that the blood counts will drop too low. So now, you know, drugs like Vonjo exist, which um, due to several other mechanisms associated with the drug are actually much more tolerated in somebody with low platelets. So if you have low platelets, you can actually take the Vonjo, hopefully get the same degree of JAK inhibition to help the spleen shrink, help the symptoms get better without necessarily making the platelets substantially worse. A lot of times they do drop. It doesn't help bring up the platelets, but it does help people tolerate more JAK inhibition, which ultimately will help with symptoms. So one thing I also wanted to add about myelofibrosis treatment is sometimes people present, they don't have a lot of symptoms. They don't have a lot of spleen related problems, but they have anemia or low blood counts. And these can be incredibly hard to treat. Um, even with symptoms and low, low red blood cell count or anemia or low platelets, it can be a challenging to treat because many of these medications lower that. Um, to treat the anemia, there are several things that we can do. One of the first ones is using erythropoietin. And so there are many agents, they go by the names of like Procrit or Aranesp, um, that actually stimulate red blood cell growth by emulate or being like we give a recombinant hormone that helps red blood cells grow. This is normally something produced by the kidney. So one thing that's important before going on one of these injections is to make sure that the kidney is not already producing enough. So for example, if you, the kidney said, oh, geez, I really need more red cells and is making lots of this drug, this hormone erythropoietin, giving more of it's not going to help the system. But in people who don't have a really high level, it can be very beneficial. The other thing that can help with anemia specifically is a drug called Danazole. It's been around for a very long time. It's there's multiple, you know, presumed mechanisms of action, but one of them is that it is kind of a testosterone derivative. So this is a medicine that can often help increase red blood cells and probably in about 40% of people. And it's a pill that you take twice a day. Um, another option, there are some drugs that are, uh, Another option, sometimes we use thalidomide or Revlimid. These are medications that have been used quite frequently in the setting of multiple myeloma um, and even a little bit in myelodysplastic syndrome, so some other blood disorders. But in the setting of um, myelofibrosis, they can be helpful with anemia and, can, and sometimes are combined with prednisone or a corticosteroid. And then finally, in terms of drugs that are being tested and hopefully will be approved at some point in the future, um, there is a drug called momolotinib, which is another JAK inhibitor that actually has some um, mechanisms that may also help improve hemoglobin. So this is something I'm really looking forward to and we anticipate may be approved by the end of the year. And finally, there's another drug called Luspatercept. Luspatercept may work in the setting where your kidneys are already producing enough erythropoietin. So the Luspatercept is an injection that you receive once every three weeks. It is currently FDA approved for the treatment of myelodysplastic syndrome, but this is something that we, has been shown to have some efficacy in myelofibrosis as well. So this could be another therapeutic option for patients with myelofibrosis. It is also important, especially for people who have post-polycythemia vera myelofibrosis, to make sure that your iron is been checked and B12 has been checked because just because you have a bone marrow disorder doesn't necessarily mean you, you don't have a nutrition deficit that may be able to help improve your hemoglobin somewhat. So these are important things to talk to your doctor. I do not recommend just starting to take iron or B12, however, if you're anemic, because in many cases you're not deficient and taking too much iron can actually be damaging. That's great advice. When would you consider a stem cell transplant? So the stem cell transplant is based on disease risk. There's a number of ways we assess disease risk. Um, the first two ones that were published a number of years back were the DIP score, which is a dynamic international prognostic system score, um, or the DIPS plus, which basically is the DIPS and then you add to it a few other clinical features. This symptom score is based largely on, you know, things that we can see without even a bone marrow biopsy. So things like symptoms, age, um, 
number of white blood cells and you know whether somebody has anemia and then the number of something called blasts which is very immature white blood cells um the dips plus takes into account low platelets need for transfusions and chromosome abnormalities which is the only test of, among that that needs to be in from a bone marrow biopsy now these were created prior to jacophy being commercially available so we have to take a little bit of a grain of salt with those because of the fact that jacophy probably has changed how long people can live with this disease now, the more recently, they've tried to account for these molec other molecular changes. So when we take, take the genetic landscape of these diseases, we have the known driver mutation, so the JAK2 mutation, which I've talked about, also calreticulin and MPL. These three mutations all affect that one pathway, the jak pathway, so they all affect the pathway that drives the disease, and they are known to be kind of mutually exclusive and definitely contribute to the formation of the disease. Some of these other mutations are called somatic mutations. They can be checked by things with next generation sequencing or, you know, genetic analysis. There's a number of different names that people use for this testing. But we look for mutations that are present. And these mutations, number one, can sometimes tell us risk. So there's certain mutations that are high risk. Other times they can actually give us um, other opportunities for therapy, um, especially if the disease progresses. But these mutations are important to know for risk stratification. For example, if somebody has a DIP score that is maybe not super high risk, but then they have one of these mutations, we know that that probably makes their disease a little bit more aggressive. And that's when we think about transplant is when we know that the disease probably has an average life. Ex you know, when somebody gets to the point in their disease where we estimate their life expectancy is around five years recognizing that we're not very good at this. <laughs> that's the time point when we start to think about transplant. But the timing of transplant is something that's extremely difficult and a very personalized decision. Um, it's something that it's really important to understand the disease risks, how we assess them, and the caveats of these disease risk assessments as we move forward planning on timing of transplant. Um, and that's something that is, is, again, a very, very important discussion to have at length with your physician. And, you know, I always recommend there's quite a few of us out there who actually specialize in transplant for myelofibrosis and having discussions with somebody who really understands the biology of the myelofibrosis is important because it's very different than a lot of the other diseases that are transplanted. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, um, patients can sometimes feel like they're bothering their healthcare team with their comments and questions. Why do you think it's important for patients to speak up when it comes to symptoms and side effects? Well, you know, there's a lot of things, you know, this is a disease, again, that we can direct our therapy many times towards symptoms. And so when we think about how do I direct my therapy? So how do I treat somebody? Symptoms are an incredibly important part of it. And it, there's nothing worse than having a patient come and see me who I see every six months because they've been pretty stable. And be like, oh, for three months, I've been feeling awful. And you're like, well, why didn't you let me know we could do something about this? So if, if there's something that doesn't feel right, it's very, very important to talk to your healthcare provider. Um, you know, I would much rather be bothered and handle something earlier on than miss something and really have a lot more catch up to do afterwards. You know, the other thing is, is symptoms that may indicate a blood clotting event. We know that patients are, have a higher risk of blood clotting. These are extremely important to identify early on because if they go unchecked, they can cause more damage. With many of the uh, treatments available as pills now, um, patients have a role in self-administering their treatment regimen. What happens if a patient forgets to take a medication? Does it impact its effectiveness? Um, you know, generally, no. I think the, 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 the ones that would is certain blood thinners, you really don't want to miss and you don't want to miss the doses on it. Um, with drugs like Jacophy, if you miss one dose, you probably won't notice it. But if you miss multiple doses, you can actually get very sick from that. So some of these medications are really important to be consistent on. Um, now, I, I know this can be a challenge. I mean, I don't take very many medications, and I sometimes have a hard time keeping track of what I take. So I know that this can be a difficult thing to do. So one thing is if you really find you're having struggling with it, you know, setting setting an alarm on your phone or your Apple Watch or whatever you know device, device you have. <laughs> can be a really helpful way of doing it. Also having a pillbox. Um, you know, they make pretty amazing pillboxes these days that can account for taking drugs once a day, twice a day, three times a day. I've even seen them up to four times a day, although generally most the most you'll probably have to take a medicine for a myeloproliferative disease is twice a day. But, you know, those are different ways that can really help make sure you're consistent about taking your medication. And if a patient misses a dose, 
do they need to call their healthcare team and let them know? Probably not just for one missed dose. Um, if like, for example, they've run out and it's, a day, you know, they say, oh, geez, I don't have any. And the, many of these drugs are specialty pharmacies, so they need to be mailed. And you know that you're going to be missing it for a while. Or let's say you look at your pill bottle and go, oh, shoot, I only have so many pills left. It is helpful to call because a lot of times, for example, if somebody's on Jacophy and they they know they're going to run out of their pills four days before they're going to get their next shipment in. Then what I sometimes do is I lower the dose a little bit to make sure they maintain a dose throughout that time. But this is something you definitely want to do under the advice of a healthcare provider. You don't want to just all single, oh, well, I'm going to run out. So I'm just going to change my dose and kind of do that. Yeah. Yeah. We received some audience questions prior to the program today. This one is from Jacqueline. What can I do to minimize pruritus or itching due to PV? A typical histamine blocker like Claritin or Zyrtec has done nothing whatsoever. Yeah, unfortunately, the itching of this is not as much mediated by like an allergic type reaction um, or histamine. It's it's a lot related to the that microvasculature, those tiny little blood vessels. Um, things like avoiding hot showers, as we talked about, um, make, taking cooler showers or, or not even taking showers, just like cleaning yourself with a washcloth can be helpful. Um, there are certain medications that we can use sometimes that help. Now, first of all, Jacophy is extremely effective for itching. Um, of course, it does have side effects. It's not always approved for your disease. So for example, it's not approved for uh, essential thrombocythemia. Um, but the JAK inhibitors can be helpful in that setting. Um, there are also medications um, like gabapentin, which is um, a medicine that we use to treat peripheral neuropathy. And that can actually be helpful because actually the itching, a lot of it is related to nerves um, not functioning right. So gabapentin can be helpful. And a really old school medicine that I sometimes use, especially if the itching is most prevalent at night, is a drug called doxepin. And that's been around for a very long time, but it can be extremely sedating and has to be used uh, with caution, especially in patients who are older. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Daniel. How often should a person with PV have hematology appointments and how often should you have blood tests? Well, that, that is something that you need to discuss with the provider because everyone's a little bit different. If I have somebody who I'm managing on a medication, they've been rock solid stable, it may be every few months that I check blood and maybe every six months that I see them. If I have somebody who's been particularly difficult to control and I'm sort of adjusting medications or they're having symptoms, then I try to check blood more regularly, like on a monthly basis. But again, this is something that, you know, I've checked blood as frequently as every two weeks, especially in somebody who has like an extremely high red blood cell count that I'm trying to lower. Um, I've checked blood as infrequently as every three months. Um, again, in somebody who's not undergoing treatment, say, for example, who has essential thrombocythemia, sometimes I check blood even less. So it really is something that can vary from every two weeks to every six months. Okay. Katie had this question. What are the signs of progression from PV to MF or AML, both clinically and in blood tests? And when do you need a new bone marrow biopsy to check for this happening? So in terms of progression, one of the signs, there's several things that, that we see happen. I think um, most importantly is let's say you have PV and you've always been on medication and it's been hard to control and all of a sudden you don't need medication to control it anymore. Or the same thing for essential thrombocythemia. You have been taking medication and all of a sudden your platelets go down and you don't need to take drugs anymore. A lot of people are like, oh, that means I'm fixed. And I'm, well, not, not necessarily. You really need to make sure to talk to your healthcare provider and potentially get a bone marrow biopsy. Um, now, the other thing, you know, is sometimes the blood count will actually drop too low. So you'll have somebody who has PV who's always been too high and all of a sudden they come in and their hemoglobin is, is very low and they're anemic. And that, that's another situation where you do that. So anytime the blood counts start to drop is concerning. Um, now, you know, it's a continuum. So the blood counts may drop as you're on the point of transitioning, but it doesn't, you know, it's, it's always, it, it's not like if your blood counts drop, you say, oh my God, I have myelofibrosis, fibrosis. I need a bone marrow transplant tomorrow. That's not necessarily the case. This is generally a transition type process. Um, also when the spleen starts to get enlarged. Now the spleen can be enlarged even in the setting of just ET or just PV. So spleen enlargement does not necessarily mean you're transforming, but it can be one of the things that we would see that would indicate that. Um, and then, um, you know, finally, white blood cell count increasing can often be a sign of that. 
Now, um, in terms of progression to AML, that is generally something we'll see in the blood. Um, and AML or acute myeloid leukemia is indicated by the presence of blasts at greater than 20%. Now, many patients with myelofibrosis in particular, but even PV and ET may have blasts in their peripheral blood. Blasts are normal. If I did a marrow and every healthy person out there, they're going to have some blasts because these are the first part of the development of white blood cells. So they're like baby white blood cells. Um, but what the problem is, is when they start to grow too much. And so in the setting of myelofibrosis and even um, sometimes with these other diseases, the blasts will be in the peripheral blood primarily because the bone marrow is damaged and doesn't hold them in very well. It becomes AML when it gets greater than 20%. So that blasts of greater than 20% in the peripheral blood or in a bone marrow, but you know, a lot of times we find it in the peripheral blood is where we indicate this, this is progressed to AML. Blasts of greater than 10% are also something that we really want to pay attention to because that would suggest that the disease is starting to become more aggressive. Now, blasts vary. So for example, I've had patients go up to 11 and then drop back down to three or four, and then they stay around three or four or five. So you always wanna make sure to double check because one blast count at 11%, whereas it's very important you know, to address, may not necessarily reflect that you need to change in treatment at that time. Again, these blood tests, I always tell people do not freak out over one blood test. Make sure you get a, you know, at least a couple of them to really confirm what you're looking at. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. And to our viewers, please continue to send in your questions to question at powerfulpatients.org and we'll work to get them answered on future webinars. Dr. Palmer, as we close out this conversation, I wanted to get your thoughts on where we stand with progress in helping people live longer and, and truly thrive with MPNs. What would you like to leave the audience with? So I think um, there are that the first thing is make sure you understand your disease. Don't hesitate to ask for a second opinion. Um, it's always good to make sure you talk to someone who can really explain. So you feel like when you go home, you understand what's going on in your body. Make sure you understand what symptoms to look for, what things to be aware of, because a lot of times people come in and they have no idea that, oh, these symptoms are actually related to their disease. The other thing to make sure is that you're very honest with your provider on how you're feeling. A lot of times people come in and they say, oh, how are you feeling? Oh, I feel fine. But then I start to ask very specific questions and they're like, oh yeah, I'm really tired. I, you know, my fatigue is eight out of it, 10 or something. So make sure you're really honest with your provider. When they ask you how they're doing, this is not a social visit. This is a visit where they need to know your symptoms. So you don't need to say I'm fine like you normally would if you were walking down the street. Um, this uh, next thing is to always make sure to know where there's clinical trials because we are making enormous great leaps and bounds in this field. It's a really exciting time for myeloproliferative diseases. And there's a number of new drugs that are being tested and coming out. So it's always important if the opportunity is available and you can do it, clinical trials are a great way to get treatment. Plus, you're doing so you're giving back because these are things that help us learn whether something works or not. So even you're not as much a guinea pig, you never get a sugar pill. Like I said, sort of it's one of those things where you will always get the treatment you need and then they may add something to it or you may be in a situation where there is no treatment, so they try something. But it's it's really, you know, clinical trials, I have to emphasize, are a great way to get therapy um, and, you know, really are how we know everything that we know a lot, you know, about treatment for these diseases. Yeah. It sounds like there's a lot of progress and hope in the field. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Palmer, for joining us today. You're very welcome. My pleasure. And it's always fun to do these things. So thank you for having me. And thank you to all of our partners. To learn more about MPNs and to access tools to help you become a proactive patient, visit PowerfulPatients.org. I'm Catherine Banwell. Thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm.